so actually with with the um unusual presentations uh part of it alma what i wanted to do was uh turn it into more of a discussion if we could so i'm going to pick on Trevina and Johan, because they're, they're surgeons as well. And before I do that, I want to just say to both of them um, that there's no wrong answers in, in, in this, the, the, this exercise. Um, so maybe if, if, if I could start with, with Trevina, how would you approach a patient that contacts you from overseas saying that they're coming back to South Africa and they want you to do um, their vaginoplasty, but they're not going to take hormones. Hi, Kevin. Um, so a patient coming back and was uh, and, and refuses hormone therapy or was okay, thanks for the question. So basically, um, Obviously, uh, I think it's, it's any any good medical practitioner should do a, a initial uh, a consultation. We're taking a good history and uh, physical examination, and basically trying to establish number one what the reasons are for not having uh, the hormonal therapy. Uh, secondly, to find out is the hormonal therapy contraindicated or not, and of course uh, try to get all the other uh, 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 readiness supporting documents um, from 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 other healthcare workers or, or from the, the the multidisciplinary team. I think in a case like that, Kevin, um, again, uh, one has to realize that not all patients would go through all the 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 the, the processes of, of a specific transition. So if 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 I'm happy with the, the reasons, if it's contraindicated, I'll definitely uh, consider uh, surgery, but keeping in mind that I would still want supporting documents from, from, from the team, as well as uh, the, the psychiatry and psychologist. Good. So the patient did their, their Google deep dive and what they read about hormones was just making them worry that, that hormones were, were probably a, a bad idea. A bit like the anti-vaxxers at the moment. Yeah. Um, so that's why they don't want to take hormones. Yeah. So I would re-educate them and uh, give them the pros and cons about uh, uh, taking hormone therapy. And I would also explain to them the reasons why uh, the hormone therapy is important, not just as, uh, 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 you know, obviously with the transition, uh, importance of the transition itself, but also uh, the whole, why it's important in the whole transition setting. And um, unless it's contraindicated for medical reasons, I'll, I'll, I'll consider it. Otherwise, I will definitely try and uh, assist them with updated information about the benefits of, of, of being on hormones. And then uh, also depends on the age at presentation, obviously. But definitely, if unless there's any contraindications, um, I would... Uh, definitely advise them to be on hormonal therapy prior to the surgery. Great. So that's what happened to me. And what I what I said to the the, the, the patient was, um, I I hear what you're saying, and uh, it's important also to consider that if in in certain countries you would have to take the hormones before they will allow you to have surgery. That's not true in South Africa. Um, I like to think we're a little bit more enlightened. But also, th there's a benefit. Um, so what, what, what I explained to the patient is that there's a lot of emotional and, and psychological benefits, as well as physiological benefits, to taking the appropriate uh, hormones. And the benefit with the hormones is that um, if they don't agree with you, you can always stop them. Um, so there may be a consideration to make before starting hormones about sperm banking or zygote banking, depending on whether it's a trans man or woman. But it is something that is becoming more and more of the, the gender spectrum, if we want to think of it that way. Um, 
so you're, you're absolutely right. You know, you, you, you want to find out from, from the client or patient um, what their reasons are um, and inform them. And I, I liked what you said, Trevino, in that we need to respect their right to decide whether they want to take hormones or not. Because I, I, I think that that is, is, is the crux of the matter uh, specifically. Good. Um, anybody else want to offer advice on, on, on that topic? Good, Johan, I've got, I've got a different question for you. Great. So a trans woman comes to see you and says that she just wants to make you to make something that looks like a vagina, but she doesn't want a vaginal cavity. Yeah, so look, um, again, like Davina said, you see the patient, you have to evaluate her holistically. I think that's very, very important. But I, um, back when we were still at Steve Beaker and that program was up and running, um, at the moment, it's, it's really struggling there. Uh, we had a few clients like these, actually, and it's fine. It's a spectrum. I full on respect that we can do the penectomy for you and uh, uh, or for, 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 for the client and do a, a vulvoplasty. She doesn't have to have a vaginal cavity. Um, it's, it's, I think it's perfectly acceptable. And the, it's for the patient to decide how far they want to go with transitioning. It's not an on-off thing. Um, or a yes or a no type of thing. It's a spectrum. So I'm perfectly Good. happy to, to continue with surgery like that. Exactly. Um, and what I did in, in that situation is, is also point out to the patient the implications of that decision. So if you opt to have the penectomy done, you then lose the option of having a penile inversion vaginoplasty done later because you've yes. lost the penile skin. Yeah. And th th that was something that, that you touched on in your talk. It's easy to take stuff away, but it's not that easy to put it back again afterwards. So again, pointing out to the patient that if we commit to that course of, of, of management, that we are limited in our options later on, should their life circumstances change, or should there um, be a, a, a need to reconsider later on because we've committed to, um, to, to, to doing a vaginoplasty without a vagina? Yeah, definitely. I, I full on agree. Good. Um, and, and that kind of highlights the, 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 the variability. Ah, oh, Graham. I was um, going to come back to, to, to your question about the appearance of the penis. And th this kind of um, uh, interdigitates with, with, with what I was, I was talking about earlier and uh, the cortical integration and what, what, what Jean Ray was talking about, about self-image. Okay. Um, so in terms of, of, of the big picture for trans men, The issue is about having an affirmed body. You don't necessarily need to have the greatest looking penis or the most functional penis. And in, in terms of the big picture, when, when, when I'm chatting to the students, um, I say, you know, it, it, it's, it's important to look at, at the big picture. So Nobody chooses to be transgendered. That is inflicted upon them by life. And that's where the press often gets confused, I think, is, is, is thinking that this is a conscious choice and uh, uh, a change in direction of life, um, which I, I, I keep trying to, to uh, disillusion them that, that nobody is transgendered by choice. Um, it is just the way that they are. So for a trans man, um, once they start on testosterone and start growing a beard and they start going to gym and developing uh, their, their, their muscle bulk, the vast majority of them are going to be able to 
and I hate to use the term, but pass as, as men in the world. And in terms of their gender identity, that is great. Even the, uh, the most promiscuous cis normative person doesn't spend more than 1% of their time actually having sex. And it also took me quite a while to realize that for trans people, in terms of their sexual identity developing, that is inhibited by being transgendered. So in terms of, of looking at yourself in the mirror and your body image and wanting to expose yourself to another individual in a sexual situation is the furthest thing from reality for the vast majority of, of trans persons. As a result of that, I think, well, not as a result of that, I think from on, on the other side of that coin is the medical fraternity thinking that trans people wanting access to surgery is for a sexual reason. Okay. And that was something that I can't remember whether it was Trevino or, or Johan picked up on in, 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 in their talk. Um, is that it's about feeling normal in your own body. And it's probably a medical preconception or misconception that the surgery that is being done is for sexual reasons. It is for a body image reason. Um, so to give you perspective from, from, from that point of view, there are far more trans men that I know who are in stable marriages with children um, that function completely normally as men. Um, and they may not have a functioning penis, but that doesn't impact on their quality of life. It helps that they have had their gender affirmed by surgery. So what it looks like is far less important than actually how you feel about yourself as a human being. And I think that that kind of answers the question. And to, to, to finish the, the, the analogy with, with the sexual function, for trans women who've been through puberty, the big problem is that all those secondary sexual characteristics have had a chance to manifest. The beard, the large feet, the hairy legs, etc. And it then becomes an issue to try and remove those characteristics so that for that 99% of, of life, um, you feel uh, affirmed in your gender as a trans woman. Um, does that kind of answer your question adequately, Graham? Fantastic. Thanks very much, Kevin. Good. Um, and just, just to talk about, uh, because I, I think we are actually over time, um, the variety of, of unusual psychological presentations. We've touched on them already, and uh, bipolar disorder is, is, is one of the key ones that, that, that I keep thinking about as well. We want to avoid committing to surgery on a, on a person who is at risk of making decisions during the manic phase of, of uh, a, a bipolar episode. Um, schizophrenia we've, we've already talked about, but I think it just emphasizes why we need good teamwork and good communication um, between medical practitioners to make sure that we um, actually avoid problems in, in the long term. I think that's enough, Alma. Thank you so much, Kevin. Um, if there are any burning questions, um, we can maybe take one last question. Otherwise, we'll close for now. Sorry, uh, the, the, the one other thing I, I did just want to touch on, Elmer, was mm. also the issue of consent mm. and underage consent. So before 18, okay? Um, I personally have no problem with operating on anybody under the age of 18 
as long as their parents who are their primary caregivers are consenting and on board. And we've had all the medical interaction that is, is required. So whether that's asking Ron to do a, a, a social background check or chatting to the adolescent psychologists and psychiatrists to say, is the patient client capable of understanding uh, the, the, the commitment that, that they are making by asking for surgery? Um, it is much, much more difficult for uh, trans persons who have parents that do not agree with them being transgendered. Um, that is a very different situation. Um, but for, for um, adolescents, um, I am fully in favor of blocking puberty so that we avoid those secondary sexual characteristics, secondary gender characteristics, I think is what we should be calling them. Um, and uh, doing surgery because going through puberty with a transgendered body and transgender dysphoria, um, I think is particularly destructive to that human being. And I think we need to try and avoid that. I'm done. Thank you, Alma. Okay. Um, there was one other question that I had. Um, the number of letters for genital surgery. Um, I don't know whether you touched on that. Um, so WPATH says two letters for genital surgery, but the practice in some places and what we're probably going to put in our guidelines might be different. Kevin, do you want to just touch on that? Yeah. So again, there are always going to be exceptions, but as a general guideline, I'm more than happy that the psychological evaluation is done by somebody who knows what they're doing and is familiar with dealing with trans persons. Because our experience has been over the last 12 years that the vast majority of trans people do not have a psychiatric or, or psychological problem. They're just transgendered. And that's the, the purpose of the evaluation is to make sure that there aren't any of, of the other things that we need to be worried about. So I'm more than happy um, doing surgery with one psychological evaluation, as long as there are no questions that are raised by that. So in other words, um, is this person who is depressed, perhaps bipolar, as opposed to being depressed because they're transgender? Um, so I'm, I'm more than happy having one letter. And I think that that is the way that we should be going because the cost driver there can be prohibitive in our, our environment. And it, 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 it's something that we've discussed at length, but I'm, I'm in favor of it being one psychological evaluation. Thank you, Kevin.